Meanwhile, the 43rd Division arrived in New Guinea, and on the beaches near Itapi, it was uh, the w the work was hard work for my it was hard work for my dad, but not particularly dangerous. He's now the commanding officer of another field artillery battalion, the the 152nd from Bangor, Maine, also of the 43rd Division. He uh, did lose several close friends in the infantry during this period due to another tragic American mistake, the placement of motor barrage on inf uh, of a motor barrage on an infantry battalion command post in the dense jungle. The artillery uh, had suffered no, his artillery unit suffered no casualties. Then, after six months on northern New Guinea, a lot of a training, on Christmas 1944, the division boarded ships for the biggest invasion of all in Luzon, in the Philippines. The return to the Philippine Islands, the, main, the return to the main island of the Philippines, where Manila is. You see on this mosaic the big line that shows where the, his division and other divisions went into Lingayen Gulf, northwest, on the, the big gulf on the northwest shore of Luzon. This mosaic also from the Manila Cemetery. Ships dotted the ocean as far as the eye could see. It was a show he wouldn't have missed for the world. He wrote, some moments are worth a lifetime, and, and these are they. Some moments are worth a lifetime, and these are they. They landed in Lingayen Gulf on January 9, 1945. The landing was uneventful, though the Navy the previous day had taken a frightful beating at the hands of Japanese suicide kamikaze planes. He went ashore 15 minutes after H hour at San Fabian. His first artillery howitzers were set up on the edge of the beach and were firing within the hour. The infantry proceeded inland, but at least one soldier saw no more than one day of the Luzon combat after experiencing the drama of the invasion. It became a fast-moving campaign with the artillery frequently moving. Dad's battalion was known to some as Bratz mortars because they were so often right behind the infantry. My father was an aggressive commander. His former soldiers today are still proud of this reputation and claim that on occasions they were even in front of the infantry. But some of his contemporary senior officers have uh, commented rather critically of him as being a shade too reckless. He was aggressive personally, too. He earned three Silver Star Medals for personal bravery in this five-month period of combat. He clearly was pushing hard. After the first phase of combat, about three weeks, the battalion spent a week of rest in the beautiful hacienda. You see what it looks like now here. This beautiful home in Gimba, where the trans townspeople arranged dances on the well-kept lawns at, in the evening then back into combat again in March. It was becoming more of a job, but not always dull, as he wrote. Yes, we did go into a new action on the day you mentioned. He's writing to my mother. And went through the Japs for three miles the first day. Since then, we've had them off balance and have moved so fast they sometimes forgot to fuse their tank and personnel mines, which helps. Those were the ones I drove over, then found them behind my car. Maybe you don't think that's a thrill. There was the other time when my car wheels went between two percussion fuses set in 100 pound, pounds of TNT and Fish's car stopped with his front tire one foot short of and in line with the fuse. His driver took one look, said, I feel sick, and laid down right there until he had recovered from the shock. There are special days and just days in combat. You can see this was one of the special ones. And later in the letter, Papa has a new bathrobe. It's the biggest I ever saw, made from Jap muslin. It is a gorgeous dark red with big four-inch light red and yellow flowers. The sleeves and pocket are light red with big yellow flowers. My name is embroidered on the pocket in script. Toward the end of this second phase, on April 5th, the 103rd Regimental Combat Team, which included my dad's artillery, was approaching a critical bridge at Lumban over the Pagsanyan River. It was in the hands of the Japanese. He earned this, his third silver star for this one. He describes it two days later in a letter to my mother. Everything turned out okay the other night. I am back at the command post and have had a good night's rest. There are a lot of tall tales about now about Colonel Cleland's and my Horatio's at the Bridge Act. I'll give you the facts, not the stories, although they are much better. 
The critical point was a long wooden bridge over the unfordable river in a deep gorge. If the Japs were able to burn or blow up the bridge, we would be stopped for days. In the meantime, we were plugging on down the road. Just before we reached the bridge, I lifted the artillery and we moved on to the bridge. Just as Cle Colonel Cleland and myself and two other officers with about 10 men reached the other side, the Japs hit the company behind us with machine guns, anti-tank guns, and a whole lot of mortar. Obviously, the comp company became very busy and we had a bridge to hold. Just then, Colonel Cleland spotted the Japs on our side of the bridge coming back. He shot the first one with his pistol. Captain Averill shot another, and his driver, Joe McLeod, from Bangor, I think, stole another. In fact, about every one of yours truly was either hitting or missing Japs. I was flat on the ground, readying for artillery fire, because there was a large group of Japs assembling about 300 yards away. Things looked pretty hot for a few minutes, but the dead-eyed dicks, meaning the guys with pistols, held out until I got the artillery on the larger group. He was stranded over there that night, but in the failing light in his foxhole, he managed to scribble a penciled note. Just a note to tell you I am okay in the trenches for the night. It is just like old times. We have been using our artillery right over our shoulders again. As usual, the nips couldn't take it. Things were tight for a while. When I visited the river, I found it to be not such a deep gorge, and I found a metal bridge constructed in 1949. My friend, the grandson of a family my dad had known, Query, queried an old man waiting for the bus, which turned out to be a motorized bicycle with sidecar. He showed us the tips of posts, which you can barely see, t uh, sticking above the water off to the right, of the temporary wooden bridge which had been built there in 1945. He further informed us that that bridge had been built in 1942 by American prisoners of the Japanese. I learned later that it was a vivid, tragic bridge of tears for those 150 prisoners because the Japanese had executed 10 of their fellow prisoners before their eyes. During a guerrilla raid, raid the previous night, several Japanese guards were killed and one American had escaped, and the killings were in retribution for that. In 1945, also, on the day the bridge was captured, this soldier of the 103rd Infantry Regiment died quite possibly killed at the bridge or on the approaches to it. In the same letter describing the bridge incident, he wrote of Easter Day, which had occurred a week before, uh, uh, on April 1st. Did I tell you I went into a church that was first built in, in 1606 on Easter? It was damaged and dirty, and the roof was partly off, but someone had kept the light in front of the altar burning. I presume a priest was somewhere nearby. Anyway, I had a little Easter service all by myself and felt much better about it. I was delighted to be able to find that church when I went through there. As we drove by the, as, as we, my friend and I, speaking for myself in 1983, drove by the town of Paquil, I remembered a delightful story my dad had written about two little girls he met there. So we drove into Paquil, the town square, complete with loud rock music coming over speakers in preparation for a festival. Back in the U.S., I found a photo of the victory celebration featuring the, the division commander, General Wing, whom you see with the wreath, sort of just to the right of center, and Colonel Cleland further to the right. Colonel Cleland, my dad's close associate, the infantry commander he worked with. It was taken a few days after the nearby bridge incident I just read about. To my delight, when I later received the full-size print from the government archives, I found my dad smiling out at me from the rear in a helmet. The only officer, the only person with a helmet in that picture. It was almost like I had met him there. He wrote about the little girls to my sister, Valerie. Did I ever tell you about the two little Filipino girls aged about four and five years? It was at a little town called Paquil and happened several weeks ago. I was sitting in my tent beside a lake resting when two of the cutest little bright-eyed girls came up to me, the, the cutest I had ever seen for a long time. They were as clean as could be, hair combed and dresses and neat and clean as the girls, meaning my sister and my mother, I think. They were barefoot. They stood in silence looking me over very seriously to see if I would be cross. Then they said together, hi, Joe. I answered, hello, what is your name? 
It developed, one was Margarita and the other, and he, didn't, he left the name blank. I next gave each a stick of gum. Each separately and very seriously said, thank you very much, but didn't chew it then. They went out and held a conference in Tag Tagalog, the local language, under the nearest tree, and apparently decided the social amenities had been observed. So they came back with a very businesslike manner and said, soup, please. After several repeats, it finally dawned on me the poor little things were hungry, but I had no soup. So I opened my locker and found a Hershey bar and gave each a piece. They ate it after the thank you very much, then said, soup now? I explained I had no soup and how sorry I was not to have soup for them, to come back some other time and maybe I would have some soup. So after they said, we go now, I said, okay, you go now. The story went on and they came back several times. And finally, he writes, I had to admit still no soup. I was very sorry I wished I could and wished I could give them some soup. They were terribly disappointed. My day was ruined, war was hell, and everything was wrong in a world that wouldn't even give two hungry little girls the soup they had waited so long for Americans to bring. I nearly cried. Just as they left, I gave them the half-used bar of soap I had been using. They fairly danced with joy, eyes bright, said, yes, soup, thank you very much, we go now. I said, yes, you go now. They raced away through the coconut grove holding hands. Americans were, Americans were dumb but nice. I collapsed in my chair. Within a few days of this April celebration and the Pak Hill event, a Pak Hill story of the little girls, President Franklin Roosevelt died in Georgia. His death reverberated through the souls of the American people, much as Kennedy's did in later years. I remember the moment I heard of it. I was 14 and had known of no other president. The final and third phase of the Luzon combat, the capture of Ipo Dam in the mountains northeast of Manila, last, lasted from 3 to 18 May. It rained furiously part of the time, but and making, making road and phone line maintenance a heartbreaking difficult task. However, some days it was hot, as he wrote to Valerie. I want to especially thank you for the big envelope full of funnies. The little surprise gum or, gum or candy bar is nice, too. Day before yesterday, I was up in the front lines. It was a terribly hot day. The ground was muddy, and the trail went up and down, steep hill after steep hill. In the valleys, I practically had to crawl through brush and vines. On the hills and hilltops, the trail went through Kogan grass, which is thick and taller than I am. I was plugging along, wishing I had water, wishing I could find a breeze, wishing the war was over, wishing we had the dam we were after, and wishing I was home, when I found a pack of charcoal gum in my pocket. I put the whole big piece in my month and literally chewed my way up to the front lines, did some survey, told the infantry commander where he was, and then chewed my way back to my car and water. So you see how much your thoughtfulness helped me. It isn't the size of the gift or its cost that counts. It would not have sold that, I would not have sold that gum for $10. That'd be $100 today, maybe. The nicest part of all was the fact that I knew all that time my girl loved me. It was just like a holiday for me. On May 18th, the dam was captured. The Germans had surrendered in Europe on the 7th and VE Day. Victory in Europe was proclaimed to be 8 May by President Truman. Unbeknownst to the 43rd Division, this completed the last serious combat for the 43rd Division. Only minor mopping up operations remained. My father was transferred to the infantry that May as executive officer, second in command uh, of the of the 172nd Infantry Regiment of Vermont Unit, I believe the famous Green Mountain Boys Unit. This was a highly unusual transfer from the artillery to the infantry, but apparently warranted in view of my father's extensive close liaison with infantry units. Upon the departure of the commanding officer for leave in the United States, he became the acting commanding officer of the entire regiment of some 3,000 men. In July, preparations for the biggest invasion of all into Japan began. They would have landed in Kyushu, you see in the map, the southern Japanese island, on November 1st, only if in Shibushi Bay. This was only a few miles from the Kagoshima Space Center where my fellow Japanese X-ray astronomers launched satellites. 
My father's regiment would land on the left flank of Shibushi Bay, on the left where you see the markings, with the critical task of securing mountains overlooking that left end of the beach, which you see here. He later told me he had not expected to survive this campaign. He wrote several times that he would have been the commander of the entire regimental combat team, some 5,000 men. On August 6th, an atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. On August 10th, the Japanese offered to surrender, and on the 14th, they accepted the Allies' unconditional surrender terms, and the war was over. He wrote that they did not have wild celebrations. Nobody was hurt, as it occurred in some places. In fact, he told of the soldier who said, oh, the war is over. I think I'll go sit over that, under that tree over there, and went and did so very understated celebration. Plans were made for the division, were changed, and made for the divisions to move into Japan near Tokyo as part of the initial occupation force. They arrived there in mid-September. Within two weeks, the division was ordered and did sail from Japan back to the United States. Each of these change of plans and moves involved a tremendous amount of organizational and hectic work. Tremendous rush in each case. It must have been frantic until the village, till they started home. At this time, Valerie and I were beginning a new school year in Washington, D.C. We had finished the seventh and ninth grades in Bangor the previous June. Mother, unable to remain separated from Abby, sold the Bangor house and moved us to Washington, D.C., where Valerie and I learned of and met for the first time a beautiful blonde, one and three quarter year old baby named Abigail. We were told she was the daughter of the natural father, the family friend, the fo and, but, the, the, but that the mother was a wife of this man who had subsequently left him. In other words, we were not told the baby was my mother's baby. On October 5th, three days before entering San Francisco Harbor my, on the USS General Pope, my father wrote a final, final tribute and plea to my mother. My dearest, lovely wife, there was little point to writing this letter, for I hope to tell you all the thoughts of it with your hand in mine. Darling, my duties are nearly over in the Army. Any time that I have had trouble, it has meant so much to me to know you were waiting with confidence in me. You have helped me to show patience with those whose performance was poor. You have been beside me in lonely spots and have shown me faith and love to shorten long days and hours. It has been memory of you and your sweetness and beauty that has held my love and desires. I have been true to you and have touched no other woman. This has been hard through the long months, but I knew you two were needing caresses and denying yourself. You have always been so clean, so true, so fastidious, so much the perfect mate that I could not leave your love even for an hour. These have been times when I lacked the courage, there have been times when I lacked the courage to continue the pace I had set for myself, when it was a temptation not to go into dangerous places that day. On those days you have reassured me and I know of nothing more than any, nothing more any man could desire than these treasures you have brought into my life. Neither do I forget the two fine children you bore me. Your love brought joy to my life when you gave me those dear little mites. Under your guidance, they have followed the right road. All these things and many more have you given me. I will always need them and you. I shall love you and cherish you through eternity. My life will be yours to use. My heart rests in your dear hands. Never try to leave me, for I can never let you free your husband, Wilbur. He arrived home in Washington on, on about 18 May. There were no parades and no large contingent of old friends. However, our family was together, and I remember vividly opening the door for him in the warmth and happiness on the evening of his arrival. He checked into the Fort Meade base and into the hospital as an outpatient. He was home a lot, and I remem remember hearing many vivid stories of his experience, experiences and a warm Thanksgiving, and a warm Thanksgiving, turkey and all. Shortly thereafter, he wrote these revealing comments to his brother Rex. He's only been home five weeks or so now. Uh, this is a Tuesday, November 27th. 
I've been quite thoroughly examined and several things of a minor nature cleared up and others treated. I'm free of an intestinal parasitic infection, have malaria but have successfully gotten off malaria medications. Teeth are okay. A fragment of steel in my right forehead, that's from that bomb, has been located and will probably be left alone. A back injury is apparently going to entitle me to a good cane for they can't find anything by x-ray. However, it doesn't bother me enough to matter. One reason I'm still being held here is simply combat fatigue. I'm just plain tired, so tired that at first writing, at first writing was difficult and enunciation poor, and I tended to be hysterical. I never noticed this. It seems that when I relinquished my command and was told officially I was tired, I just all at once realized and admitted to myself and then was tired. I am much improved after a month here, mainly due to a lot of sleep and freedom from responsibilities, so will likely be released soon. I've avoided many outside contacts, largely because of the above reasons, but now I hope to get organized on the matter of a job. I don't know if I will go back to Maine or not. His old job at the University of Maine, head of the dep chem department, was still waiting for him. The schools there aren't as good as I want for the children, and frankly, the winter there doesn't appeal to me now. Some job farther south, where there are good schools, would interest me a lot. I may look around this part of the country while I'm here, and will consider industry as well as university work. Also, I have a lot of study to do, since I've already, some I've already started. In fact, he found the study of chemistry quite discouraging. He'd forgotten a great deal. To mother's great distress, he had given away he gave away many of his chemistry notes to a scrap paper drive. There was, and she frantically went searching, trying to recover them unsuccessfully. There also was tension between him and mother. I do not know the de details of that, but suspect they really didn't talk much about how they f really were feeling about things. Five weeks was not very long. Later that week, his malaria flared up again. On Saturday, he decided to stay home rather than return to the hospital. In the morning, while Valerie and I were off at music lessons in the dentist, he was sorting souvenirs for it. He was sorting souvenirs in the basement for Christmas presents. His personal 45 Colt pistol was among them. Mother heard, heard from upstairs, heard a loud bang, and went running into the street for help.
My mother married Monty, Abigail's natural father, in 1947. During the 32 years of their marriage, she worked tirelessly with him in his various newspaper enterprises and unselfishly cared for him during his last years. He died in 1979. She also continued as a supportive and attentive mother to us children, sometimes too attentive, we thought. She also managed to keep up her piano playing, but unfortunately is now no longer able to play. Valerie is a journalist and realtor. She lives in Maryland, has three grown sons and one grandson. Abigail, born in 1943, has three children, including two-year-old Christopher. She is married to a dentist and lives in New Jersey. Another sister, Dale Ann, was born in 1950. She is married, has two daughters. She resides in Curacao and works in public relations. Dave, my audience will fall asleep if you make me do this too much. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say that. <laughs> Should I go? Not yet. Happy, I Some of us have to wear a suit coat. My wife, sister said, what the hell are you wearing? I showed up in no tie, no jacket. But she said, this is Washington, D.C. You gotta be formal. Huh? Yep. Okay, we're rolling. Upon my arrival at Munda Airfield, I asked if the guns were still on Banga and was told yes, one of them. My guide was Alfred Basili, who had been a scout for the 43rd Division. He took me in his 30-foot canoe with a 25-horse outboard motor. As I look back over this presentation, which I made some 20 years ago, I recall well how on my 50th birthday in 1980, in a resurgence of nostalgia, I found and reread some of my father's letters. I discovered how well written they were. They are descriptive, technically accurate, at times humorous, and always labeled with a date, which enables the larger context to be known. Most were to my mother, but many were to his parents in Indiana, and some were to me and to my sister Valerie. We were 10 and 8, respectively, when he went on active duty. Fortunately, in 1981, I was able to retrieve almost all of them. They paint a comprehensive, rich, and personal picture of wartime from the eyes of a single soldier who happened also to be a good writer. This account is based on these letters, on historical accounts, and on my recollections together with those of my mother, relatives, and his military associates whom I interviewed in the 1980s. The photographs shown are from personal family collections, the World War II Signal Corps collection at the National Archives, and my own visits to the Philippine and Solomon Islands in 1983. The occasional background piano music is from recordings of my mother's playing. The narration is preceded and followed with a mobile artwork of Thomas Kovacevich. In this work, he placed two pieces of paper cut to different shapes, one a square and the other a circle, on a large triangular sheet of plasticized but porous fabric that floated on a bath of hot water. The hot vapors rising through the fabric are absorbed by the paper pieces, causing them to curl up and move in largely unpredictable ways. The complete piece shown at the end of this presentation is eerily 
reminiscent of my parents' lives. This has been a recreation of a talk I gave at the Liszt Visual Arts Center of MIT in April 1985 in collaboration with Mr. Kovacevic. The scenes of his work are from that presentation. My narration was redone and recorded in 1986 at the Democratic Media Center in Washington, D.C., and the original editing of video, photos, voice, and music was done there also. My sister Valerie organized and assisted with the production. Subsequent editing and labeling were provided by MIT Video Productions. I am now retired and living in Salem, Massachusetts. Dale Ann now has four children and we four siblings, my mother's four children, all have bragging rights about our grandchildren. Three of our spouses survive, as do two of my three older stepbrothers and all of their spouses. My stepfather treated Valerie and me as his own, and the two sides of the family, Wilbur's and Monty's, have remained close to this day. I am now 74, and my generation is passing on. There is now a multitude of younger family members, including at least two in the womb as I speak. This story of our family's upheaval during the so-called Good War and its eventual survival is intended for them.